All right. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is staying cool out there. I think we're in record-breaking heat today. Um, I Tonight, we're going to be talking about a bit of a unique insect. Uh, this is one that has not yet been identified in Indiana, though, honestly, I think that's simply because we just haven't looked hard enough. Um, this moth has spread through uh, various portions of the world, and it primarily occupies an ornamental that is extremely popular to plant in the Midwest and several other parts of the United States. And today, what I'm talking about is the fox tree moth. Um, it's right there in front of you on the screen. It's actually kind of a pretty little moth. Um, it will be noticeable, thankfully, uh, but it does significant damage to one of our favorite ornamentals. So just diving into some of the usual questions we get about a new invasive that we talk about, the first one being, where does it come from? So this one, like most of the invasives that we deal with these days, is a native of Asia. It comes from areas that include Japan, Korea, China, and portions of Russia. Now, we are actually not the first victims of this particular bug. This, uh, the initial spread of this invader was originally detected in Germany in 2006, and it spread like wildfire. Now, the reason for that is, is that they over there in Europe also plant boxwood as an ornamental, but it's also growing in the wild there and in, in some of the environments over there. So it's got a lot of food sources that it was able to take advantage of throughout the European and Eastern European areas. Um, and it's just kind of all over the place there. We finally started identifying it within the last couple of years, originally here in the United States and Michigan. But just before that, we were also able to identify it in Toronto and Ontario. And I'm guessing most likely it was in other areas in Canadian provinces as well. Now, the good thing about this is that it is specialist. It will specialize on boxwood. It doesn't really go after any other plant. So there's a little bit of good news. But the trouble is, is they are very good at ruining boxwood. And by the way, the name of this insect, the box tree moth, for those of you who don't know, sometimes boxwood is also referred to as box tree. So we are talking about those plants. So this just kind of gives you an idea of what that European invasion looked like throughout the years. You could see there in 2007, it was initially identified in Germany. Since then, it spread through a lot of the more commonly thought of European countries, France, England, Spain, uh, well, Spain in 2013, or after 2013, I should say. And it just began to go everywhere from that point. Um, you can see on there, there are a few areas that look like they're still white, some countries that look like they're still in white. Part of that is, is that some of those countries may not have reporting mechanisms like the others do for this. Um, I would be very surprised if not, if all of these areas weren't infested with boxwood complete or with box tree moth completely. Um, though, keep in mind, there are some mountain ranges in there that may prevent its travel as easily as it would across some of the flatter lowlands. So now let's go over the plant itself. This is one that we have all seen. I have a set of boxwood that form a hedge outside of my house. So a lot of us are gonna be very familiar with this plant, but let's just make sure that we are talking about the same thing and go over a few of the issues that already exist with it. So this is the genus Buxus. There are several species that we plant of boxwood. There is not any one single species. Uh, like I mentioned before, these plants are some kind, sometimes called box trees, and they are evergreen. Uh, the one I have out in front of my yard, it never goes, it never loses its leaves. It stays green all year round, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. The species do originate in Europe and in Asia, so it was brought over here at one point. Um, it is very naturalized here. It's not any way considered an invasive. It is an ornamental plant that is safe and intentionally planted. Uh, a lot of that reason, too, that boxwoods are so ingrained into ornamentals is because they have been a part of gardening for as long as recorded history has existed. Um, there are certain records, archaeological records, that demonstrate that approximately 4000 BC, people were using boxwood as a part of ornamental plantings. So this is a plant whose fate and history is thoroughly intertwined with humanity. Uh, we have several species that we commonly use here in the United States. We do have American boxwood, there's little leaf boxwood, and there are several others. Some of those species um, are Asian in origin, but please keep in mind, none of these are problematic species. These don't spread. The only hard part about them is you just need to keep them cut, and that's about it. 
Now we can normally identify boxwood very, very easily. They have these nice short oval leaves. Now, mind you, that is depending on species. There is some variation with some of the different species, but for the most part, these are the ones you'll see. They will have short oval leaves with white pubescence along the mid rib of the underside of the leaf. And I'm gonna show you an image of that here momentarily. The stems of boxwoods tend to be square, but I noted that that doesn't really hold very clear as a diagnostic trait, depending on your species. Like as the bark builds up and sheds, you may notice that it's a little harder to tell that the stem is very square on it. Um, boxwood, again, it grows a lot. It needs to be shaped, but the good thing is, is that it's very easily shaped. You can maintain its shape. It will, I think I need to trim mine about once every year and a half, two years. Um, so it is, an, it's a very easily managed plant, which is why it's so favorable in ornamental plantings in our yards. It doesn't cause any problems and it looks good. Now, just giving you a little bit of a slightly bad picture that I took there. This is my boxwood. And what I'm showing you there is that uh, white pubescence along the underside of the leaf, along the midrib. So it's very easily found. You can actually see if you look a little closely, my boxwood's already suffering damage from other things. Now it's not caused by box tree moth, it's caused by other pests. And this is kind of bringing me around to my next point here. This is where some of you may not like a whole lot of what I got to say. Boxwoods already have a few issues. And honestly, boxwood right now, it's probably not the best thing to plant because it has so many issues. Um, first off, one of the other invasives that we are already dealing with in boxwood is called boxwood blight. This is an invasive fungal disease. It was discovered in 2018 here in Indiana in December. Um, it is present in at least 24 other states as well as the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm guessing it's most likely present. Fungus originated in East Asia, and it's often easily confused for leaf spots and other forms of damage. Um, I get quite a few contacts from people asking if they have boxwood blight. Most of the time, it's a symptom of boxwood decline or leaf spot disease rather than the invader. Uh, but it is present. It is causing a lot of problems in our boxwood plantings. Now, as for the boxwood decline I just mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, this is one of the bigger problems that I think we need to pay more attention to. This is a complex, really. It's a combination of infection by different fungus fungi, uh, Pasteliomyces, Volutella, Macrophoma, and Phytophthora. And all of these are extremely common throughout uh, plantings, regardless if you're in a garden or an ornamental landscape piece. Um, I think Phyto Phytophthora is probably one of the most, if not the most common fungal disease that we have in plants in the United States. And when you combine these together, along with environmental issues that include temperature, soil chemistry, and plant nutrition, you're suddenly seeing that boxwoods will start to decline and you'll think that, oh, do I have boxwood blight? Do I have this or that? When in reality, it's just kind of this perfect storm. By the way, right now we're in record setting heat. That's gonna play a part in the health of your boxwoods and probably quite a few of the plants that you care about. So once the heat breaks, you probably wanna check on a few plants. Make sure you're watering too. Now, what's gonna happen as boxwood decline is occurring is that you're gonna see plants will develop spindly growth and you're going to see branch and leaf die off. Um, oftentimes, like my boxwoods, I'm seeing signs of boxwood decline and them. I'm seeing leaf die off and branch die off where you'll just see one section of the plant itself just suddenly go yellow or brown and then obviously is dying. Um, that is a pretty good sign of boxwood decline. And here is one example of that taken from my boxwood about two days ago. And you could see that that's a pretty obvious sign of this uh, particular condition at work here. Now, if you look closely at the leaves in this picture, there are also other signs. Um, those of you who know me, you know that I'm an entomologist. I study bugs and I love talking about them. And I'm seeing a lot of insect damage or arthropod damage, I should say, on these boxwoods. Boxwoods um, are very, very resilient plants, but they are not immune to insect damage. There are a few insects that are gonna be serious problems on them. I should rather, I should say a few arthropods in this case. So boxwood leaf miner is an invasive fly that's entered the US and spread across it. Uh, larva will form tunnels in boxwood. So you'll see leaf miner damage in boxwood leaves. 
Um, I do not know that this is present in Indiana. I should double check that, but I certainly have never seen any signs of it. And I've visited quite a few uh, clients' homes where there's boxwoods where they have questions and I've yet to see it myself. Um, boxwood mite is probably the more common issue that I would find in boxwoods. The damage that I was seeing on the leaves of my plant are almost entirely caused by boxwood mite. So this is a relative of the two spotted spider mite. It is another spider mite cousin, and it will feed on the underside of the leaf, scraping away the surface tissue and causing some leaf loss. Um, you'll see leaves will get this kind of whitened appearance, like somebody scraped something and there's white underneath the scraped area, and it'll just begin to reduce the health of the leaves. It is a spider mite, so you may see some webbing occur, though I don't think it's quite as uh, prolific with webbing as the two-spotted spider mite is. And then, of course, boxwood silids is another insect. Now, this one is one that is definitely doing damage to my boxwood. And I'm going to show you a picture of how to find that because you will see that they will cause leaf cupping. And they're also going to cause damage to the surface of the leaf tissue that you will kind of resemble the same damage you're going to be seeing from that boxwood mite. So right here, this is damage being caused by a boxwood silid. If you look at the paler green leaves, you can see those leaves are cupping now and there are damaged areas on them. Now, some of it is a little bit of plant disease. Just looking at that image, I'm seeing a few spots that are probably more fungal disease rather than insect damage, but the leaf cupping is a very clear boxwood silent damage and example. All right, so I have just filled you with all the great reasons of why not to plant boxwood. Now I'm gonna tell you about the worst reason that unfortunately we will probably be dealing with right now. So the boxwood or the box tree moth, Cydaloma perspectalis. Um, this one I've gotten to learn quite a bit about. It's been talked about quite a bit amongst invasive species specialists in the last several months now. Um, I'm looking forward to getting a few samples, but at the same time kind of dreading it as well. So this is a moth. They do damage very similar to most other moths that we deal with. Um, the damaging stage is going to be the caterpillar. The adults are not going to be capable of feeding on leaves. Uh, they only live for about a month and they die off. The caterpillars are the ones who are going to be consuming the leaves. Now, the good thing is, is that identifying the presence of box tree moth caterpillars is very easy because their damage is unique and they are the only caterpillar that is going to feed on boxwood. The bad thing about them is that these moths are extremely prolific. They can easily produce several generations that are concurrent with each other in a single season and they're very good at overwintering. They can go as low, temperatures as low as 22 degrees or negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absolutely stunning that this insect can survive that. Um, and But since it has been able to survive in several areas in Europe, which are a lot colder than we are in some spots, that does make a certain amount of sense. Now, a little bit on the life cycle of this one. I'm not gonna go too deep into this one, but I do want to give you an idea of how quickly it can reproduce. So what happens is that the eggs are laid on the underside of boxwood leaves and they hatch in three days. I have never talked about an insect in all of the programs that I've done that has a hatch time of three days. That is insanely fast. Obviously it's gonna be temperature dependent, but that also kind of tells you they don't overwinter as eggs. They don't spend enough time as an egg to overwinter. Now the caterpillars are going to immediately, as soon as they hatch, begin starting to feed on the leaf tissue and they will develop into adults, not go into a pupa, but just uh, develop into an adult all that time in 14 days, two weeks. So they will go from cat caterpillar to pupa to adult in 14 days. So that means that the total time for a new generation to be created is 17 days, 17 days for them to become sexually reproductive. Um, that's about as bad as I've seen it with an invasive species. That is not a great situation for our boxwoods. Um, this means that we can have many generations occurring all together all at once. Um, so obviously that's a problem. Now you may wonder, okay, what does that damage look like? How bad are we talking here? Well, I'm gonna show you a little bit of what you're gonna look for when you're looking for the box tree moth, and then I'm gonna show you what that damage looks like. So first off, this is these are what the eggs look like. Keep in mind, the reason this picture is so grainy is because they're getting very close to the tiny leaf of a boxwood. And you could see that grouping of eggs right there. Uh, the funny shapes and lines in them are quite literally the egg yolk and the developing exoskeleton of the insect itself. The caterpillars are going to stand out a little bit, thankfully. 
So they do tend to be pretty bright green with yellow and black striping on them. Their head capsule is going to be kind of dark, either very dark brown or black. Sometimes that head capsule will be kind of outsized compared to the body as these insects develop. And then as they get bigger and bigger, you'll see that their body gets to size up to their head, so to speak. The other thing that will let you know that those caterpillars are present is that these caterpillars will spin webbing and they will cover a boxwood in webbing. So that will be extremely obvious. Now this leads us to our next life stage. Keep in mind these are but these are moths, so they do have complete metamorphosis. In this case, they're going to metamorphose into their chrysalis or pupa, where they're going to develop into an adult, and they're going to nestle those pupal cases in their webbing amongst damaged leaf tissue. So that way they stay safe, and it also makes them hard to get rid of too, because they're getting through all that webbing and pulling them out. It's going to be a challenge without doing more damage to the plant. Now the pupa is going to, this one I thought was really interesting because the colors are maintained as the pupa develops. So if we go back to that last image and look at the picture on top there, you can see that that pupil case on the top image kind of resembles the caterpillar a little bit, which makes sense since the outer casing is created out of that same exoskeleton. And then below that, you could see that the pupa has now primarily become translucent because we are seeing the colors of the adult moth coming through very, very clearly. So that makes them very easy to see too. And to me as an entomologist, that's just a plus sign because that means that I'll be able to identify them very easily and most likely you will be able to as well. Then finally, we get to our adult stage. Um, we don't have many moths that look like this one. And I actually really like that. I think this moth is actually kind of pretty in a way. It looks very delicate. Unfortunately, it's just, it is such a big problem. So the moth is a little bit average size. It's a part of a family that we don't normally talk about. This is family Crambidae. Um, normally, when we talk about moths, we are talking about a very, very cosmopolitan family called Noctuity uh, or Geometridae. But in this case, we're talking about Crambids. Um, it's average size. It's got a wingspan of about an inch and a half when they're fully, when they've got a good meal behind them, we're able to develop well. Uh, the adults will have white wings that are going to be bordered in brown or tan with a noticeable comma shape. So let's go back to that previous image here. So you can see the wings, the forewing and the hind wing are primarily white. They have that brown border. And then you can see at the forward edge of the wing, there's this kind of funny comma-like shape. And that will be true for just about all the adult moths that you are going to see of this species. Now, there is a small percentage of them that may not have the white. Some of them may actually be melanized or they may be fully brown. And here is what that comparison is going to look like if you look for this moth. Um, the body shape is maintained. Nothing else is really going to be that different. You're just going to see where there should be more white. It'll actually just be brown. The hardest thing you're going to deal with here is that if you do see melanized moths, they may be a little harder to tell apart from others. However, a lot of the moths that we see flitting around lamps at night or other places, they're usually going to have this model pattern to them, whereas box tree moth has these nice panels that stand out and are very obvious. All right, so a little bit more on these adult moths. Like I said earlier, um, they only live for about a month, so they're not going to be around long, but during the growing season, they're always going to be present because they can create so many generations within a single uh, season that it doesn't matter. You're just going to constantly have an adult moth somewhere. The unfortunate thing about them, too, is that they are actually very good flyers for moths, and they're able to migrate up to four to six miles. So that's going to be a little bit of a problem. Sometimes moths tend to be carried more by the wind or other things, but in this case, these guys are actually pretty good at spreading. So if one person gets them, they're probably going to act as a source that's going to begin to spread across everyone's yard or across the landscape, depending on what you have planted there. But keep in mind, they only go for boxwood. So that's what they're aiming at. Now, how do we detect them? This is the easy part. This is what the damage of the boxwood, box tree moth looks like. Um, that is definitely not pretty and it will stand out. So you can see there in the bottom right image, we've got severely damaged boxwood that has a lot of webbing covering it. And that webbing entirely comes from the box tree moth caterpillar. In the top right image, you can see the leaf stripping. This is how they feed. What they'll do is they'll consume the green leaf tissue, but they'll leave 
it's the harder to consume midrib. So that way you're going to have this weird spindly appearance to a lot of the leaf structure there. That damage will definitely stand out. And depending on how healthy that population of moths is, it could happen very, very quickly too. Uh, and one thing that I really want to point out too, is I mentioned the, the webbing created by a spider or spider mite. This webbing is going to be intense. Caterpillars produce a significant amount of webbing if they produce webbing. Uh, it's a part of their salivary glands and they will just drop it wherever they go. And if you have enough caterpillars are all producing webbing, your plants will, your boxwood, I should say, will be very covered in it. So that will stand out and that webbing will hold in their frass, their poop. Um, it'll block light from being able to reach things and it'll just create a very nasty situation for the health of the plant on top of the feeding damage they're already doing. All right, so I have given you a whole boatload of bad news. So now let's see what we can do for the good news. How do we manage these? So I like to start off by talking about uh, ways we can manage them by just simply avoiding pesticides to start. Um, the good thing is, is caterpillars can be handpicked off of them, but depending on the population, that could be a lot of caterpillars. So getting out early and acting on it, if they're present, is going to be something you're going to want to do. Uh, the larger caterpillars being the easiest. Now, there are some opportunities and research going on about using monitoring traps to see if they're present. There is a sex pheromone that this moth uses that traps can be loaded with to attract box tree moth. And six, since it is a sex pheromone, it's not going to attract anything else. It's going to be very specific to that box tree moth. But traps really, in my opinion, are best used to monitor and not try to control the population. You can also use horticultural oils, insecticidal stoves, and uh, some biopesticides such as spinosad to try to control them. Um, I think that since we don't yet see them here in Indiana, uh, or at least we haven't identified them yet here in Indiana, we need to do a little more work to see how effective that's going to be. The other option that we have is that there are pesticides that have been proven to be very effective on them, mostly synthetic pyrethroids. So products such as bifenthrin, lambdocyolothrin, cyfluthrin, permethrin, et cetera, there are dozens of them. Um, they are very good because they tend to be very good on moths and butterflies. Uh, we also have the option of using BTK. Now, those of you who live in Northern Indiana may be familiar with this. This is a type of BT. It's a protein derived out of a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. In this case, it is a version that has an additional name, uh, Kerstiki, I believe, that's particularly well known to work effectively on moths. We use it quite a bit to control spongy moth in Northern Indiana. And it looks like it does have good effect on the box tree moth. Now, that being said, I want to reiterate, we have not yet identified it in Indiana, but I expect that to change very, very soon. Um, I think that most likely next summer or next spring we'll see it if we don't see it already this year and people just don't know what they're looking at yet. So like I normally do at, with my programs, I want to encourage all of you to please go take a look at your boxwoods, see what's going on there, and report it. So I'm, I have, like I always do, I've got information here that you can use to report. You can always email me. My email is right there. Or you can call 1-866-NO-EXOTIC. That line leads you directly to the Department of Natural Resources, who are the regulatory arm of controlling a lot of these insects. And by reporting it to them, we'll be able to get it on EDMAPS. You can also get it entered onto edmaps.org yourself. That helps us map out the presence of different insects and will be a huge help in tracking them. There are also other ways that you can reach out. We maintain Report Invasive. We have them on social media and just as well as, like I said, your ability to contact me. There are also resources that we have at Purdue University, Purdue Landscape Report. I just put out something on them. Or I'm sorry, Alicia Kelly, our state survey CAPS coordinator, put out something on them. And we, Penn State also has a significant amount of information on boxwood moth. All right. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for your time. That was a quick one tonight. And I will be happy to take any questions you may have.